Hello and welcome to episode 25 of A's for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. I'm talking today with Albania Neva about her brand new book, La Tour for Architects, published by Routledge at the end of March this year. But Latour says instead of looking at society as the cause, society cannot explain anything. I mean, society has to be also explained. And if we take this idea in architecture, we could uh, tell to architecture, architectural critics, architectural scholars and practitioners themselves do not count on society explaining or providing answers, uh, but rely on the power of architecture and um, the connectivity that architecture uh, and architectural production provide. So you can craft societies yourself. You can uh, uh, craft social links and social relations in a much more powerful way than sociologists uh, can uh, do. You can craft entire new cultures in designerly ways uh, through uh, the power of your design, through master plans, through inventive urban uh, solutions. Do not rely on cultural concepts or cultural cliches to come and infiltrate your practice. A is for architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm here today with Albania Neva. Professor Albania, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Ambrose. It's um, a pleasure to be here in this conversation with you. So my name is um, Albena and I am trained as a sociologist. Uh, and I engaged more than 20 years ago, I engaged in a wonderful adventure of taking sociological methods uh, in the field of architecture. I was trained in a sociological tradition um, that is not always proud uh, to define itself as a sociology. Um, it's the pragmatist uh, sociological approach at Bruno Latour. And this is an approach that very often criticized traditional uh, sociologists. Uh, so it's a type of sociology that is close to anthropology. Uh, and um, 20 years ago, I started exploring um, some of these methods and concepts and how they can be uh, transported and translated into the field of architecture with the very first study in the practice of uh, metropolitan architecture in Rotterdam, which resulted in an ethnography of architecture in the making. And I have spent 20 years of my um, professional life developing further this uh, methods and this insight uh, from um, a pragmatist uh, the sociological approach of Bruno Latour and translating some of these ideas for architectural research and architectural education as well. At the moment, I'm a professor of architectural theory at the University of Manchester and also head of the Manchester Architecture Research Group, uh, teaching at the Manchester School of Architecture. Fabulous. So you've got so many interesting things in there. You're going to have to start off with pragmatist, first of all. I'm not going to... Um, uh, my, my, my wife, who trained in philosophy, she would be able to hang with that. But I, I, we need to understand better what pragmatist is and what's it in relation to, what's it responding to. Right. Uh, yeah, practice is usually uh, defined in opposition with critical, uh, the critical approach, the critical uh, thinking, which is, I would say, much more um, kind of popular in the field of architecture. Uh, in, in particular, in the past 20, 30 years, we have seen uh, the critical approach uh, flourishing um, in the field, uh, critical uh, thinking in uh, the architectural discourse has been developed um, and has been very uh, powerful uh, in the field. If critical thinkers uh, look at architecture, they try to explain architectural uh, practice, architectural uh, creators, architecture architects and other participants in this process by looking at social factors, uh, social influences, cultural influences or political factors that have had an impact on architecture or on design products. 
um, critical uh, thinkers um, would uh, rather start from the process itself, from the production of architecture itself, uh, rather than trying to explain uh, architecture making and its products with forces outside architecture, such as society or zeitgeist or cultural uh, factors, they will rather look at what happens in the field of architecture, what kind of um, kind of uh, Feel forces are at stake uh, there, how uh, co- collaborations uh, become possible, how architects uh, connect to um, other type of industries, uh, but also to different other type of participants, like engineers, contractors, but also politicians, policymakers, uh, funders, uh, and developers, and how all these uh, participants in architecture making uh, contribute to uh, the final uh, result. So the starting point for pragmatist is the process itself rather than uh, the factors outside uh, this uh, process. Pragmatists are also interested in uh, pragma, uh, things, in things, uh, and pragma is the Greek word for, uh, word for things. Um, they're interested in uh, the things themselves, objects, technologies, materials that also uh, mediate human relationships and make possible uh, these uh, processes, the processes of architectural production. Um, and in that sense, the pragmatist approach uh, very much uh, focuses on uh, processes, materials, technologies, the everyday um, experience of designers and other participants in architecture, uh, rather than um, on factors and influences outside. This I process. see. That's brilliant. Well, a lovely, clear, clear explanation. Um, <laughs> really, really useful, actually, to begin with. So I, I sent you, I sent you those provocations, I suppose, and, and some of them are... Um, A little bit, you know, I get a little bit lost in words, particularly when I'm dealing with sociology and philosophy, which which I think. But we're talking about your new book, one of your new books. You have two coming out this year alone, which is amazing. But this one, Le Tour for Architects, which is part of their Thinkers for Architects series uh, published by Routledge. And it's a really elegant book. And I've touched on in Le Tour in my own teaching a bit because I've as you know, been exposed to sociological thinking. But I suppose for architects, and we were just talking about this before we started recording, not all architecture schools, not all architects are perhaps comfortable or au fait with thinking of themselves or thinking of their discipline as sociological and perhaps defining sociology to begin with and how sociology or sociological approaches to architecture might be a good place to start so like sociology the study of societies is that it yeah the study of society of social life social change we could say social factors that have an impact on human activities on human behavior on uh, human action traditional sociological approaches um, would look at society as a separate domain of activities, um, as um, a domain that has its own institutions, its own rules. Uh, society is something also fixed for these uh, traditional approaches, sociological approaches. Um, society is very often composed of social groups or classes. Uh, so that's the kind of common approach uh, that uh, we have in sociology. Um, Bruno Latour's approach to sociology is um, very different. Um, uh, He uh, tells us something very different. Don't look at society as something uh, that is out there, that is already made of different entities, social groups or classes or or struggles. Um, This 19th century understanding of of society, uh, let's say. But society is rather something that is being made on a daily basis. It's not a thing, it's a movement. It's something that we make through our actions, through our connections, through relating to each other on a daily basis. So um, we should even not talk about society, tells us Latour, but we should talk about the social, this kind of social links and social connections that we create through our actions and through our 
daily interactions. Um, and that's a very different thinking about society and therefore a different type of sociology. It's not mm. the sociology um, of society, it's sociology of the social, sociology of social associations, um, we might uh, uh, say. Um, and uh, this idea translated in, uh, into architecture, of course, uh, gives a, different, uh, a di- completely different result. We might say designers um, have been always interested in society, right? Design is not isolated in, uh, from society. Design happens in uh, society. And through our design uh, products, uh, through the many different design projects and master plans we develop, we also end up uh, crafting uh, social links. We also contribute to the crafting of very specific social uh, relationships uh, among different communities, uh, clients and communities and different other participants in our uh, project. So architects actively contribute to the production of social links uh, to um, associations, as Latour uh, might say, rather than looking at a very static uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, construction of uh, society. And in that sense, Latour's uh, sociology of Uh, associations, uh, I would say, is much more relevant to the work of uh, designers. Mm. Uh, It is particularly relevant now because there's much more awareness about the social aspect of the architectural production and the social impact of um, buildings, master plans and and urban concepts that we produce Mm -hmm. as designers. So so the 19th century idea of sociology or of society is that it's a like any phenomenon you know in that kind of enlightenment way any phenomenon can have a line drawn around it and you examine and explore it and then you describe it and then you tell people i suppose how to fix it in in a certain way and then the Latourian idea is 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 that what you describe is a snapshot of a timeline so your your sociological engagement or your research engagement with society can only ever describe a fragment or a moment within that system or or is there is there some way that Latour's ideas enable us to kind of gather in a a, a complete picture so that we can define it again or, or or is the point to resist definition yeah exactly that's the the point is to resist the definition uh, entirely yeah you're right uh, and he also, he's very radical. He entirely dismisses this kind of old-fashioned uh, understanding of society as something that is static, that is made out of groups mm-hmm. uh, uh, and uh, establish a number of social groups that yeah. we can all understand and measure. Uh, most of the sociologists also um, kind of traditional type of sociologists also employ uh, statistical methods, all sorts of quantitative methods and um, uh, rarely uh, qualitative uh, methods. So he's going against, he he goes against this entire tradition, Mm -hmm. uh, which um, is a a very much a a critical thinking inspired tradition uh, that comes from Durkheim in French sociology and uh, the uh, pragmatists. And he's also trying to come back to some of the kind of uh, fathers of uh, founders of uh, French uh, pragmatist thought like um, Gabriel Tard, and he um, tries to um, put all these kind of two concepts in, in dialogue, Tard and your kind. Uh, and um, uh, the confrontation between the two approaches, which is pretty much what defines um, uh, French uh, sociology and which also has defined uh, French sociology in um, the 90s, uh, we also have to understand that Latour starts de- started developing this um, approach um, in the 80s, uh, when um, uh, right, in, right after the, in the aftermath of uh, the structuralist uh, wave, uh, when um, we also have um, the um, uh, post some of the post phenomenological approaches are uh, trendy uh, at that moment, um, all these kind of understandings of, of uh, the importance of a human experience, of subjective experience, of the embodiment 
we have Merleau-Ponty, we have all this tradition as well. Um, so there's a lot going on in, at that moment in social sciences in the 80s, uh, and uh, it's a radical moment uh, for Latour and other pragmatist thinkers, a radical moment uh, of departing from this traditional sociological um, type of thinking, um, exemplified by, by Pierre Bourdieu, for instance, in French academia. Uh, and uh, this uh, happened very often uh, as a confrontation between Latour and Bourdieu and the two camps of sociologies uh, that uh, we uh, had in France at uh, that moment. Um, a sharp confrontation uh, and, and debate where it was not possible to build an argument with, without demolishing the argument of uh, the others. Maybe we don't go into details into this because it's very biographical for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it sounds good. It sounds very good. I, I do quite like the idea of two sociologists going to war and trying to demolish each other's uh, ideas. But the, the the methods you talk about. So you mentioned at the you mentioned at the beginning this uh, association of pragmatist sociologies sociologies uh, with anthropology. So are the methods of a pragmatist, are, are Latour's methods and your own methods, I suppose, are they derived from anthropology? So things like observation and ethnographies and um, I suppose in a way some, more of, the, some of the more uh, um, activist type ethnographies, um, so, you know, participant observation and... and um, uh, yeah, some of the getting involved. Is there, is there that element to it? How is it done? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, you're right. Yeah, uh, in in that sense, a pragmatist, I'm much more inspired by anthropologists, the work of Clifford Gates from classic kind of anthropology from the 70s, uh, through to um, kind of experimental thinkers like Garfinkel, for instance, uh, in the 70s, who started developing the ethnomethodology as an approach to also question uh, this kind of static understandings of society, the ethnomethodological experiments of, of Garfinkel have inspired a lot uh, Latour, Boltanski, Michel Calon, all the thinkers uh, uh, around this uh, method at the time. Uh, and, uh, mm, and in that sense, um, um, also uh, ethnography, anthropology and eth methodology uh, have inspired uh, the very methodology of actor network theory, uh, which consists in following the actors and actively trying to understand uh, um, their world building activities is the role of objects, the role of non-humans, of all those participants in the making of the social uh, links, of the social relations. Uh, um, in that sense, they are very active methods, as you say, and uh, this is closely related to this uh, active, uh, to this understanding of uh, society as something that is in the making, that is constantly in the making, making the um, uh, social link as something that is uh, being uh, constantly negotiated between human actors, but also humans and objects, uh, rather than a static, established definition of society that is out there, structured, mm -hmm. has its own institutions and uh, policies and its own uh, structure. So, I think this is really. So you've you've, you've mentioned now actor network theory, which I think means that Pandora's box is officially open. Um, and I wanted to get onto that, but this idea of an ethnography is sort of it sort of implies to me a kind of an involvement of the researcher in the life in the reality of the research, the subject of the research. So it seems to me that there's a kind of ethical motivation behind what you're describing. If, if, if classical historical sociology is about trying to describe this thing over there like a, like a bacteria under a microscope, then what we've got in Latour's idea is getting involved and becoming implicated in the life of your subject. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but, and why is that? Why why does he want yeah. to get involved? Um, 
Yeah, that's a, a good a question. You described this uh, very precisely and very beautifully. Uh, so rather than looking at, um, let's say, an architectural product or an architectural practice uh, from a distance mm -hmm. and relying on a number of written sources, secondary sources, um, or looking at them under a microscope, as you said, We, as uh, pragmatist uh, uh, researchers uh, using ethnography and actor network theory, we would rather go and visit this architectural practice uh, and we'll try to engage with um, the everyday uh, rhythm of the practice, uh, just as I did with the OMA uh, at the time in my very first study, instead of relying on everything that was written on this practice, and there's a lot written <laughs> on the OMA, uh, it was 2000. 2001 as well, when um, Kohas got the Pritzker Prize and the practice was uh, really well researched uh, and there was a lot going on also um, from the point of view of uh, histor historical and uh, critical uh, studies of architecture. Um, but my intention was very different. My intention was to actually uh, stay there in the practice rather than interviewing the star architect just once and going back home rather than just taking a number of of uh, documents and archives uh, from the practice and consulting uh, secondary sources and then go back home. I stayed in this practice for two years and I really engaged uh, with very closely uh, with uh, the work of uh, designers there. Um, and in that sense, this is a method that requires a lot of time, a lot of involvement, a lot of presence of the researcher in um, the site uh, of observation, uh, which in this case was uh, the Rotterdam office of OMA. Um, and uh, it is uh, time uh, consuming and it involves a lot of uh, intellectual and of course emotional investment uh, from the part of the uh, researcher. But it allows us uh, to uh, paint a completely different picture of this practice. Mm -hmm. A picture where the star architect disappears entirely, yeah, because if you stay two years in the office, uh, you mainly see the younger designers, the other participants in the process, the engineers, value engineers, structural engineers, contractors, the clients visiting, uh, um, the architects presenting the project, calculating budgets, scaling models, trying to gain more knowledge about a building to be. All these processes um, are extremely important and versatile to follow, and you can fully capture the complexity of architecture making when you are there and you can follow all these uh, processes and you can talk to all the participants in uh, this practice mm. uh, rather than just the star architect so in that sense it is a very um, um, it's a very um, engaged um, Uh, participation in the life of the practice as well it's, it's really interesting isn't it and it's and it produces a But I've put in a provocation, a sort of controversial description of architecture, which which counters the way it is, the way it presents itself. I think not just the way it is perceived, but the way it presents itself to the public, which is about objects. It presents itself through its television programs, through its prizes, and through its construction of star architects and great buildings. Has something to do with um, it's about things and it's about very precisely defined things. But your approach blows the doors off that, doesn't it? Just n smashes it apart, and we get we end up with an instead uh, an idea, as you say, of architecture made up of people, processes, things, policies of everything. And and this is and this is at the heart of Latour's idea of actor network theory, isn't it? Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, in addition to this, um, uh, when we are there in this practice, and I have been in many other practices uh, ever since, um, in different uh, contexts of, of practice as well, including archiving recently with a study on the Canadian Centre of Architecture and the production of archiving. So when we study those processes, we are very far uh, from a fixed definition of the groups, 
architects versus engineers or architects and archivists. So we question the very uh, nature of those uh, groups and groupings. Um, <laughs> another aspect of an act, actor net, network theory approach is that we also question the nature of the action because when you follow an architect designing with a scale model, we don't know uh, any longer, you don't know any longer who is acting on what and who is acting when we say an architect is designing. Mm -hmm. Is it the model talking back to the architect or is it the architect controlling and mastering uh, the uh, foam material to shape a very specific uh, form? Is it the software guiding the designer or is it the designer uh, controlling uh, the software? When you follow architects at work, this distinction between subject and object, between technology uh, and aesthetic aspects of a design project uh, tend to mingle. They tend to hybrid, hybridize, to to, co to produce complex uh, hybrids or assemblages, as Latour uh, uh, calls them. But we can only see this if we are in the process, if we're in the middle of those actions so that we can witness how designers act and interact. Uh, and uh, therefore, we don't know uh, any longer um, who acts in uh, this situation. Act action is constantly overtaken. Action constantly progresses, design process progresses by deriving rather than by following a uh, step-by-step linear uh, course uh, of action. And also uh, the third aspect, we might say, of an actor network theory approach to architecture in the making would be um, the uncertainty around the nature of objects themselves. Um, and this tradition, the Latourian tradition, um, uh, emphasizes a lot uh, the importance of object materials, of active matter in uh, human interactions and in the building of, of uh, social uh, relations. When we follow designers at work, we can see this uh, very uh, clearly that uh, there are a lot of materials, technologies um, and, uh, and objects that constantly uh, um, have an impact on mm -hmm. uh, designers that constantly impinge on uh, design and uh, uh, it's not uh, possible to tell any longer uh, how exactly a design uh, concept emerges. It's in this constant interaction with, between people and things, between humans and non-humans, Latour would say. Mm. Um, it's not, uh, however, we cannot, however, argue that the objects uh, are doing things instead of us, instead of humans, but action is distributed between humans and non-humans. Objects, uh, materials, technologies uh, are those who facilitate or uh, we might say mediate uh, human uh, relations rather than uh, causing um, disturbances uh, or uh, rather than entirely shifting the source of action towards uh, towards the object. That's really... That's, um really good and really clear um <clears throat> but this this idea i'm and there's still this sort of aching question and it's going to sound either dumb or rude but i don't think it's going to sound good which is you use this word uncertainty um it generates uncertainty around the nature of the processes but also the nature of the objects themselves so this this way of exploring or or, or critiquing or analysing architecture and its production creates this uncertainty. Why is this a good thing? Like, why do we need? Why do we need to to disassemble this? I suppose more traditional description of architecture as objects and architects as creators and the architectural process as linear and you know what is what is what what does this do yeah um well it um helps us um to produce i would say a more realistic understanding of architecture and mm -hmm. architectural processes uh, mm -hmm. let's take the aspect um, of linearity yeah mm -hmm. if we describe a design process after the fact yeah we can draw a beautiful diagram and we can say well that's how we did it first we did this second this third that um that's how we did it um However, if we are there uh, at the moment when, when uh, the design uh, process 
unfolds, when, when we are taking decisions, nothing looks linear. We cannot, we cannot say what's first and what's second, what comes first and what's second, who uh, had the, the idea and what uh, happened afterwards. Yeah. Um, so um, an approach, um, an anti-approach allows us to be there in the heart of the action and to follow some of that of these uh, decisions as they happen and to uh, be able to produce a more realistic understanding of design uh, in the making. Mm -hmm. uh, another aspect, and you are right to call it controversial, um, why do we need the uncertain? Why do we need to question uh, the number of the groups or the agency of the objects or the, mm -hmm. the nature of action? If we can take it for granted, yeah. If we if we can take a definition of uh, what um, the social groups are or what society is or what action is, and then we can apply it on architecture, it's an easier approach. I agree, but again, I'm not quite sure that this would lead us to a different interpretation of architecture or architectural creativity or architectural and urban uh, processes. Uh, and perhaps to give another example, again, coming from uh, Kulhas, is that um, uh, there was so much written already on uh, Kulhas from a critical perspective. Um, uh, a number of interpretations uh, revolved around his personality as a creator and what had an impact on his uh, work. Uh, for instance, the work of Le Corbusier, the, the Russian constructivist, uh, Miss Van der Rohe, they all had an impact on uh, his ideas and um, they were important influences on his architecture. Uh, and a number of theorists and architectural historians were already debating this. Uh, then there was a lot written about uh, his writing on New York and his um, uh, the congestion congestion culture in New York and the fact that he's Dutch and how his Dutchness had an impact on his ideas mm -hmm. and he, his interest in New York because the first settlers of New York were Dutch recreating uh, um, Dutch uh, cities and concepts mm -hmm. of Dutch urbanity with nostalgia but in uh, the context of New York City and and we can extend all these interpretations that may mainly look at influences upon the creator, the creative mind. And there, were, uh, there was also a lot written from the point of view of um, architectural history uh, um, on uh, the social and political factors that had impact on some of his buildings, uh, or uh, if we look at buildings like Seattle Public Library, how American cultural politics had an impact on this building, or Cordoba building, how uh, Portuguese um, culture cultural climate at that moment has an impact on the concept of this building and we can extend the list. So everything that was written at the time was either um, theories and interpretations that revolved around how society and culture has an impact on the products of architecture or how different theoretical and biographical influences have had an impact on the mind of the creator. So it's either the individual as a powerful individual creator or uh, so the society and culture and how they have an impact on architectural production. But there was nothing written and, and no interest whatsoever on the design process, on the actual process of architecture making in the practice of this architect and uh, many other architects. So you mentioned Dana Kaff, for instance. So this is this was one of the exceptions um, at uh, the moment to have a study of um, architectural uh, processes mm -hmm. um, and architectural ne and negotiations of architects with other participants in design making from with uh, an ethnographic uh, perspective uh, mm -hmm. but very little research in the field that will rather focus on the process on the practice itself and will open the black box of design making by uh, focusing on the actions of the designers rather than the established discourses. I'm the practice rather than the theories. I'm starting to understand it. I think what it is, what I'm like, you're trying to, dis well, you are, dis the enterprise is concerned with describing reality. And I, that sounds rather a daft idea, but, but within the field of like pure design, so in the design studio, we, we tend to think about so you're more, more like a scientist. 
your approach is to there's value in describing the reality of the design process because it is a phenomenon to hand and therefore to be able to describe it accurately is an important aspect of human understanding which i think is really really amazing and i don't know why i hadn't thought of that before Thank you. It's 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 realistic. I think I insist on the on the word realistic because we have different interpretations of design process, right? Mm-hmm. But very often we tend to either mythologize or simplify those processes, mm-hmm. or refer to other forces that are there at stake, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, perhaps uh, sometimes very very far from the kind of the reality of this process. So. Uh, yeah. Describing realistically what happens uh, in uh, design uh, production uh, is the intention of this uh, pragmatist approach, which I know it's not always what architects expect to hear. Yeah, that's from my practice. Not every architect uh, will be open and has been open for my um, in my practice of 20 years of, of, of um, mm-hmm. using this approach and, and working alongside different architects. I have seen that not everyone is... Uh, brave enough or open enough to uh, open the door of their uh, office um, and have uh, an anthropologist uh, working there and and following architects at work because they can tell any story they want because we can see the everyday production of architecture which is not always uh, beautiful uh, to describe. Uh, uh, You look at the kitchen of this process uh, and not everyone is uh, happy with uh, the kind of stories that that uh, could be told on the basis of this uh, daily mundane technical processes that we witness. Yeah, and and not just mundane, but mundane incorporating a lot of the attrition and conflict that actually characterises particularly controversial urban projects. But I, I mean, I, I can see entirely the value in starting to pick apart the the influence, say, for example, of software or materials, or even as you as you put it, you know, model making. How that might actually start start forming um, the way architecture performs actually is produced. You know, the the, the architect's capacity to use a piece of software or even the management structure in the practice, which means that certain types of people are most likely to use certain software, which leads to the model making, which is the drawings that presented to the client. So the client is actually selecting architectural productions based on some 21 year old. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I can see why that's important. Actually, this is a very, you know, effective, effective analytical device. Um, This idea, though, it breaks apart traditional ideas of the fixity or the firmness of architecture, so that, that a Vitruvian idea of firmness, commodity and delight. We lose firmness. Perhaps we gain something in the commodity, though. And you suggest that replacing it with a kind of situated reality is, is the way forward. What does this look like? Like, what is the architecture that comes off this? Of, of, of a Latourian, if an architect was to em, em, embrace Latourian thinking, to recognise their kind of... I mean, after all, your book is called Latour for Architects. So let's say an architect embraces right. Latourian thinking. What does this do? What, 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 what can we expect from this remade? Right. Um, in addition to... Um having uh, embracing this uh, realistic perspective uh, uh, to their own work which uh, will give architects uh, perhaps uh, a more earthly approach um, a more grounded earthly approach to their uh, work I think they could gain what they could gain from a Latourian uh, perspective is um perhaps more confidence uh, to rely on uh, themselves and everything they could create uh, in designerly ways uh, rather than relying on um, society or political uh, forces as um, 
type of causation as something that will uh, have an impact, as, as forces that will have an impact on uh, their work, but they could also uh, that could also explain very easily uh, uh, their uh, work, um, which has been something that uh, is criticized a lot by Latour and other uh, pragmatist thinkers. The fact that we constantly, in architectural uh, studies, we constantly uh, refer to um, society as uh, something that could explain what happens in architecture as a cause mm -hmm. uh, and architecture is uh, the uh, effect um, and um, this is my translation of, of this thinking into architecture of course there's, there's nothing written by um, Latour and other pragmatist thinkers on architecture so I'm translating so to say uh, this uh, thinking uh, but Latour says instead of looking at society as the cause um, society um, uh, uh, cannot explain anything. I mean, society has to be also explained. Uh, and uh, uh, if um, we take this idea in architecture, we could uh, tell to architecture, architectural critics, architectural scholars and practitioners themselves do not count on society explaining or providing answers, uh, but uh, rely on the power of architecture and um, the connectivity that architecture uh, and architectural production provide. So uh, you uh, can craft societies yourself. You can uh, uh, craft social links and social relations in a much more powerful way than sociologists mm -hmm. uh, can uh, do. You can uh, craft entire new cultures in designerly ways uh, through uh, the power of your design, through master plans, through inventive urban uh, solutions. Do not rely on cultural concepts or cultural cliches to come and inf inf infiltrate your practice and your uh, field of work, but try to question and reinvent all mm. those forces that are outside. Because very often uh, we say uh, architecture is one of those unique fields that is so often submitted to external forces uh, and even dependent on, entirely dependent on external forces. Uh, but if we look closely at uh, the architectural production, at the, we can under, better understand the agency that architects could have in this situation and we could empower architects to use this agency and uh, actively uh, contribute to the production of new cultures, new social uh, groupings, new social relations, and even political links. I see. So this is this is really good. This is really good. So if we've had over the course of the second half of the 20th century, the descent of architecture, I often think of it as the descent of architecture away from perhaps agency. You know, you get that post-war period where architects become absolutely critical to the redefinition of society in particularly Western European or the European context. But even arguably in the post-colonial context where you get architecture emerging as a device for reframing uh, uh, re-dependent rather than independent, re-dependent kind of um, re-independent um, uh, societies. And then we kind of end up with this that, you know, around the millennium we end up with this kind of frilly architecture that's not doing very much. And, but it looks nice. Um, and there's been, I think, over the last 20 years, a kind of idea that architecture should, architects should have a moral uh, or ethical um, role. I do remember talking to a professor of architecture, actually debating with a professor of architecture, who suggested that architecture didn't have an ethical imperative. And I was, I was scandalised by this. But I, th I think in retrospect... His saying that was much more controversial than me saying that it did. I think actually that's quite a... Either it's, it's humble or it's very controversial, but uh, the architects have tended not to embrace their ethical potentiality and responsibility. So, so this act and network thing is, is really interesting. And I, and I put in one of, our, one of the provocations I put forward that this, this role, this way of understanding the architect makes us, a, to use your word, a diplomat in that they are a kind of go-between for the user, for the encounterer of the building, and the producer of the urban space. Or, um, and I think that's a really interesting idea, and it gives architects an enormous amount of power, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. Yeah, the uh, the architects uh, architects become uh, diplomats, mediators. We can call them also within uh, this kind of complex fabric of um, society and cultures. Um, pretty much similar to their buildings as well. And again, here in um, an, a Latourian thinking with Latour, we could say there's some kind of symmetry that could be established because um, uh, this approach is very much in, inspired by anthropology of technology. So uh, in the, the very first studies of um, uh, pragmatist uh, sociologists uh, were uh, on uh, technological systems and also technological objects, uh, mundane artifacts uh, like uh, um, seat be- the seat belts in our car or uh, uh, the simple key that we use to open our door. Uh, um, uh, objects like this, mundane uh, objects, technical objects that we consider in a traditional uh, sociological perspective, we'll consider just passive objects, just out there. They don't contribute to social uh, relationships. Uh, No, Latour says, actually, this divide between technology and society is not productive. Uh, The divide, as the divide between subject and object, uh, is not uh, productive. So we have to overcome this division between subject and object, between technology uh, and uh, society. Uh, Technology from mundane uh, and simple objects to complex technologies, they participate in the making of societies. They mm-hmm. actively participate in uh, the crafting of human uh, relationships uh, from uh, technologies like um, cable technologies, car, uh, cars, IT technologies, uh, the trains, all these kind of technologies of 20th uh, century. Um, and we can continue the list to buildings and infrastructures. They all take part in uh, the construction of uh, societies they, uh, as they all mediate uh, human uh, relations. They uh, become mediators. So architects uh, gain this m- important role of mediators, of diplomats, also because the products of their activities, buildings, master plans, complex, sophisticated technologies, they um, have this power to mediate human mm. uh, relationships. They um, architects delegate this power to uh, buildings uh, and other architectural works uh, that uh, continue the work of mediation of diplomacy and continue uh, to produce social uh, relationships and actively participate in their crafting. That's really that's really good. The the so one of the. Yeah, one of my questions is, is is that in this idea of the diplomat, the architect becomes, well, it's different as an idea from the idea of the architect as ringmaster, isn't it? Where, where the architect stands in the centre and orchestrates people around with a whip and kind of makes people do as they see fit, uh, makes them jump on top of a giant ball or beg or run around in circles, whatever it is. Um, and I think that's a really interesting difference because the, the 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 risk would be in understanding architects in this very very central, very important role is that they become imposers once again of a top down vision, which to me contradicts the idea that you've expressed elsewhere in Luturian um, sociology of Every, of the everyday so so the architect rather yeah i guess my interpretation initially was the architect here is becoming very very powerful again and and how do you have how do you preference everyday life ordinary life um mundane life when the architect has got so much agency but if the architect is a diplomat rather than a kind of conductor then perhaps that's the way it can it can work. So there's a humility required in this role as well. Right. And it's also a distributed agency that's important to remember. I mean, it's not just the architect there uh, in uh, her or his uh, full subjective power exercising uh, this uh, agency mm-hmm. or uh, control, uh, but this is very much distributed, distributed mm-hmm. in a number of ways, uh, distributed um, in the collective process of 
architecture making because the architect is never on her or his own in a mm -hmm. practice. There's a number of expertise um, that uh, is needed in architectural production today and um, even more after the digital turn where we see a different um, organization of the work in architectural practices. It's not just the architect, but we, we see uh, IT specialists, uh, archivists, record managers, PR managers, especially in big uh, scale uh, practices. Uh, so all uh, this in addition to uh, collaborations with engineers, contractors, clients, communities. So all this kind of collective production of architecture, uh, if we account, fully account uh, this aspect of collective uh, social production of architecture, then uh, the agency becomes more and more distributed and shared with all those uh, participants. And it's very much shared uh, with uh, the materials, the technologies, uh, the models, the softwares that actively take part in the design uh, process. Agencies constantly distributed if we look at the process of architecture making. And as soon as the product is there, this uh, uh, agency is delegated to the product, to the kind of material arrangements uh, and uh, smart design solutions that are already produced. And once there in uh, society, uh, they start uh, mediating uh, human relations. They, they talk on behalf of the architect. They continue the agency of uh, the architect, which is constantly distributed. So it's never a human, a, a fully kind of uh, <laughs> full mastery of the world. It's never mm. a few, full subjective agency, so to say, but it's constantly distributed with others. And these others are either humans or non-humans. This is really, there's a, parallel here isn't there in in the way that i mean this is going a little bit off the provocations i sent you but this idea of the artwork the definition or the defining of art is never the is never the um the privilege of just the artist they they you know they they make the the work and then it's presented to the public or to its public which might be a private collector it might be a public piece of uh, civic artwork and they have no control at that point about its its actual identity. It is what it is, and people will take from it what they will. And in a way, strangely, this idea, this Latourian idea, gives the... which is scientific, or sort of scientific-like in its detail and it's particularly in its engagement with technologies nonetheless has this effect of translating all the architecture almost into an artwork that is something that as you say is distributed it, it, it's the cognition of it is distributed to as many people who, as encounter it absolutely yeah yeah if we look at the uh, studio of rembrandt <laughs> For instance, it has been studied in history of art, and maybe you were thinking about this example. Svetlana Alpers, the historian of art, studied uh -huh. uh, um, the studio of Rembrandt. So we see this active collective production, the students replicating or producing the sketches and, and uh, uh, producing many versions before the masterpiece is kind of mm. finally uh, uh, assembled together by uh, the master uh, and of course the many different materials that uh, uh, take part in this uh, production so it's a very similar uh, picture in a way yeah. uh, but painted in the field of art and we have the work of ha uh, Howard uh, Howard Becker in the 90s who talks about the collective production of art so some of, our, of these ideas uh, kind of more pragmatist uh, ideas mm. have indeed infiltrated history of art and sociology of art uh, at that moment we're mm. talking again about the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. yeah, I just like the way that I just like the way that it does this by this this twofold thing of both this approach of analysis, both defines technically the the networked qualities, the uh, the assemblage of factors which produce the thing, which at the same time has the effect of making the thing almost uh, unearthly. Um, um, artistic, um, but I just wanted to—I I just wanted to come to the, at the last. So obviously, you teach in architecture school, and uh, how do how 
how do you go about doing teaching this pragmatist sociology, this Latourian perspective to students? Because I think it's got huge benefits, and I think it. And I, I actually, my gut feeling is that it is almost universal. In that you see now ideas around mapping and the kind of networking of ideas. You know, in the way that students now present their work, it's it, there's a hu- huge impact of Latourian thinking. You can see that, of act- actor network thinking is there, even if it's not understood. But how do you go about teaching it? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a very important question. Well, I uh, I have um, um, done many different experiments, many different translations of some of ideas in uh, architectural courses, uh, both at the level of BA and MR uh, teaching, uh, sometimes perhaps without even mentioning Latour or actor network theory, especially actor network theory is a theory, uh, is a concept that sometimes cares, especially (laughs) BA uh, students. Uh, I use simple terms. I use ethnography, for instance, uh, or I simply tell them instead of looking at the products, let's look at the process. Um, And uh, I teach them, uh, this is a BA level, we very often look look at architecture uh, in the making. We uh, look at um, uh, design practices very often for for architectural students. This is their very first encounter with practice. Um, I uh, teach them uh, some of the steps of the method. And then at the end of the course, uh, which is called ethnography of architectural practice or architecture in the making, depending on which group of students it, it is uh, addressed to. Um, architectural students have to do a visit in a practice, but they have to stay a little longer, one, two, three days, depending on how familiar uh, they are now with uh, the context. And they have to follow the activities of designers. They have to interview um, designers um, and other participants in uh, the design process process uh, and uh, uh, they have uh, to try to understand also uh, the different type of agents that participate in this process both material and uh, human uh, and they produce an essay at uh, this uh, at the end of uh, this course this is one one course I have developed uh, as a general uh, kind of uh, pedagogical philosophy I would say I would not provide them with a definition or with an explanation, but I'll ask them to try and define, to to do um, to start a little inquiry, a little uh, study, mm-hmm. and to try to reach their own uh, definitions, uh, so they can provide explanations of a particular process at the end of their mm-hmm. project. And another course I have developed its mapping controversies in architecture, where students, uh, but more advanced design students in their MARC um, studies, uh, they uh, can use the advanced design skills they have uh, to um, not to draw a building, but to draw the agency of a building, what the building can do, how a building, especially controversial building, uh, can intervene in our lives, can divide communities, can bring people together. And they usually look at uh, um, debated controversial project that is uh, very, that is discussed in the media, let's say, as soon as they open the newspapers in the morning, they read something about an urban development that is very controversial, and they start Start following this debate, so students have to follow uh, the you know, controversy or at urban and or design scale uh, for two or three months. They have to collect um, the, the media reports. Uh, they collect a lot of clippings. And then on the basis of this data, they uh, start mapping. Um, and by mapping, I mean analyzing and drawing the list of all the actors that participate in this controversy. Mapping is analyzing and visualizing this complex ecology of the building. So all these kind of actors uh, that participate uh, in uh, architecture making in an urban debate, you can beautifully see this in a controversy case, because very often something that we assume very simple as very simple, something that we think is decided either by designers or politicians uh, suddenly gains a uh, huge complexity when it's debated, when it's contested. Mm-hmm. And suddenly there's so many other actors that you don't expect to see, let's say in a controversy about um, 
the heat row uh, extension, uh, architects expect to see just the architect <laughs> and the yeah. planners or the politicians. And suddenly they see a crowd of other actors, uh, the ecological organizations, uh, the land loaners, the village representatives of the village communities, so all those who are affected by design. And they suddenly understand the huge complexity of this, um, of this uh, design uh, projects. And they start mapping this controversy by trying to analyze and visualize this complexity using design skills that they usually apply to um, generate form uh, or to uh, visualize a building. Here they use these tools to uh, trace this complex uh, social ecology of a building project or a design uh, controversy. Uh, and um, recently I have done some projects also on uh, climate change and um, uh, cosmopolitical design, trying to reflect on this, on the new climatic regime and what uh, this uh, this, uh, this climatic regime does um, um, to architects, uh, landscape architects, and how um, this new thinking about nature, something that is complex, nature that is not just passive any longer, like 18th century uh, romanticized uh, version of nature. Um, uh, but rather very complex and active with the new concept of Gaia, uh, nature that is uh, constantly, uh, Gaia who is con constantly intervening in our world. So what does mm -hmm. this mean for, means for designers and for landscape designers? Uh, and I think there's a lot that could be done now. And Latour is currently working on these issues as well. Yes. Uh, really, Gaia. really, really good. I'm very jealous of your students. I um, <laughs> Sounds really good, but I'm going to finish... I think we should finish on one thing, which is in 1999, Bruno Latour in the Sociological Review questioned the actor, the network and the theory of actor network theory. <laughs> and I just want to know right, what, what, was he, what was he playing at and what does this do and um, what do you think about that? He questioned everything. Well, uh, that's very typical for sociologists to <laughs> constantly revise their work <laughs> and to question what they have done uh, years ago. But um, uh, I, from my perspective, of course, I'm not an uh, um, 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 advocate of Latour's uh, writing, although as a student of Latour, as, an, as a disciple of Latour, I'm very often asked similar questions of uh, why is he contradicting himself? He has yeah. argued something in 1996 and in 2003 he argues the opposite. Um, well, uh, for me, the important question here is what do we take from these ideas, insights and concepts? And for me, the important um, um, the important thing to take is, uh, is rather methodological insights, not ready concepts, because not every concept from uh, the sociology of Latour or from pragmatist uh, thinkers uh, could be um, transported into architecture without translations. So mm. We have to think what this means. Uh, most of the um, empirical studies uh, Latour ha has done and uh, are in the field of uh, sociology of science, for instance. Uh, Laboratory, uh, laboratories, um, uh, um, sociology of technology, where he studied huge projects like Aramis and other uh, other uh, technologies. Um, he did uh, studies on Pasteur, for instance, 19th century France. So all these um, empirical cases are very different. So when we take an insight, a concept from there, mm -hmm. we have to think very carefully how uh, this concept could work in our field, what this concept will mean in our field and question uh, this uh, rather than what he has written in different times and how he contradicts and every big sign every big thinker in a way uh, contradicts uh, himself and I think it's kind of uh, normal because uh, their thinking evolves as well and empirical uh, empirics also inform uh, this thinking just like the pandemic now is informing our thinking mm. and we cannot think of non-humans without thinking about coronavirus for instance yeah uh, and what uh, this uh, virus has done to us and to our um, social uh, relations over the past uh, two years so empirical cases and how we translate um, in methodological insights into the field of architecture is extremely important and that's what I take uh, from a Latour actor network theory for me is not a theory it's a method methodology and that's what Latour says very often 
it's a methodological approach. Yeah, it's a methodological approach that we can take to understand any uh, uh, processes in any field. And uh, that's an approach I have been using over the past 20 years uh, to explain different um, empirical phenomena in the field of architecture and perform different translations in architectural education as well. And that's what the book is about, about illustrating some of these uh, insights, um, um, debating how they can work uh, for architectural thinkers, uh, trying to convince them perhaps to take uh, one or another uh, perspective and taste it uh, in their, test it in their, in their work. Uh, and um, Try also to I also try to uh, to show uh, how uh, this uh, slightly unconventional and different insights, methodological insights, can open new avenue for research uh, in our field uh, avenues that are very different from the existing uh, critical approaches. Fantastic! Thank you so very much, uh, Albena. That was really really clear. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Your questions were fantastic and also the comments in between. Yeah, I cannot imagine a better discussant and you're also the first reader, Ambrose. So I'm very, very uh, flattered and very honoured to have this first discussion with the first reader of the book, <laughs> Le Tour for Architects. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was beautifully written. I mean, a really, really good piece of work. That was sweet as a nut, was it not? Thanks to Albana for her clarity and for tolerating my questions. Thanks also to Fran Ford at Routledge for bringing us together and for the book. Please see the podcast description for a link to the book, for Albana's academic profile, social media links, and a link to a recording of a great talk she gave for McGill University in April 2021 called The New Ecology of Architectural Practice, an actor network theory perspective on the effects of COVID-19. And of course... Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow and share. It is for architecture everywhere you go now. Cheers. Cheers.